Welcome, everybody. <coughs> Welcome to the panel discussion under the title 100 Years Since World War I, Dictatorship and Democracy in an Age of Extremes. My name is Matt Schultz. I'm the director of the Waterloo Center for German Studies. The Waterloo Center for German Studies is hosting this panel discussion. Uh, we collaborated and we are collaborating with the departments of French, History, and Germanic and Slavic Studies. And I'm very grateful to the chairs of these departments and to the colleagues in these departments for their support for this event. In front of you, you've got uh, four panelists, and I'd like to introduce them one after the other. Monsieur Consul General Casabon. Bienvenue à l'Université Waterloo. Merci beaucoup, euh, merci beaucoup euh, d'être venu. Euh, Consul Generalny euh, Majorski. Euh, sorry? Grzegorz Morawski. Morawski. Sometimes hard to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> almost perfect. Witam i was w Uniwersytecie Waterloo. Dziękuję bardzo za wasze przybycie. Der letzte ist einfach. <lacht> Herr Generalkonsul Stechel, äh, auch Ihnen herzlich willkommen. Vielen Dank Danke. für Ihr Kommen. Gary, Gary Bruce, uh, Chair of the Department of History at the University of Waterloo and a Germanist and European historian. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests and panelists. We're going to proceed as follows. Each of the panelists will open with a brief statement. Uh, they're going to take turns, obviously. We're starting with the uh, Consul General from Poland, followed by the Consul General from France, and then from Germany, <coughs> and then last but not least, Gary Bruce. Um, in the second part of this panel discussion, it's not called a panel discussion for nothing, uh, we're going to have audience participation. You have a chance to ask your questions, make your comments. I'm sure there will be also some discussion among the panel members. And we're hoping to kind of do this entire event in about 90 minutes. We're starting a little bit late, but it's still within the, oh, almost within the academic order. So, <laughs> Consul General, your turn. Uh, it's, oh, it's working, OK. I hear. So uh, good afternoon. I think that's better, yeah? Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Schulz, Consul Stechel, and Kasabon. It was my pleasure to be here uh, tonight at uh, this event. The topic is uh, very wide, 100 years of the history of Europe, so it's wow. So it's for uh, tons of books. But uh, I have uh, 15 minutes, so I um, try to say everything what is the most important from the Polish perspective. Uh, we, are, uh, we are here uh, at the lecture in the Weimar Triangle formula. The Weimar Triangle was established in the German city of Weimar in 1991, aimed at assisting Poland's emergence from communist rule and refers to loose grouping of Poland, Germany, and France. It exists mostly in the form of summit meetings between the leaders of these three countries. So let me say, uh, thanks to Professor Schulze, we transpose it today uh, to the local Canadian ground. <laughs> OK, so going to the topic. As I said, I have 15 minutes only. Uh, the outbreak of uh, hostilities in August of 1914 automatically breathed fresh life into the Polish question. As for the first time since 1762, Berlin was at war with St. Petersburg. The solidarity of portioning powers, Austria, Prussia, and Russia was broken at last. Yet the possibility for independence could not be laid. Both the Central Powers and Russia competed for the Polish support, promising various degrees of autonomy. Over the four years of hostilities, political atmosphere was transformed that allowed Poland to gain independence. Russia, once the powerful Tsarist Empire, was, looking, was losing the war, and Tsar Nikolai II was removed, and eventually murdered by the Bolsheviks in 1917. While both in Germany and Austria-Hungary, Kaiser and Habsburg monarchies have collapsed. Following independence, 
Poland was facing serious threat coming from the Bolshevik Russia. Invading communist army was stopped on the Warsaw outskirts in August 1920 in the battle later known as the miracle of the Vistula. So, uh, the Soviet defeat meant that any communist expansion to the Germany or Europe was at least temporarily contained. Upon regaining independence in 1918, Poland was facing many difficulties, including war damages, ravaged economy, six currencies were in circulation, and ethnic minorities. There were four languages in command in the army, three legal codes, two different railway guards, and 18 political parties. Years of unstable parliamentary democracy and lack of progress in economic reforms created conditions for a cut by Marshal Piłsudski. For the next 10 years, Piłsudski would shape Poland's political life. The rise of Adolf Hitler to power in Germany and threats of communism were concerned to Poland's shaky independence. The Nazi propaganda machine turned its attention to Gdańsk, German Danzig, and to what the Germans called the Polish Corridor. The Polish leaders, however, knew that any concession given to Germany would lead to the similar fate that Czechoslovakia faced. In August of 1939, the Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union signed the Non-Aggression Pact, uh, also known, uh, well known as the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. In the Polish eyes, this treaty meant yet another partition. A Polish commander-in-chief, Edward Ritz-Schmigły, rightly described the current situation. With the Germans, we risk losing our freedom. With the Russians, our souls. With Germany invading Poland on September 1st, 1939, the Second World War started. Poland's difficult situation become, became even more grave as the Soviet Union honored the pact with Germany and invaded Poland from the east on September 17th, 1939. For the next six years, both the Nazis and the Soviets have established rule of fear, terror, and ethnic cleansing. Poland became, as one historian described, the bloodlands of Europe as more than 6 million Poles perished in the concentration camps and more than 1.3 million of Poles were sent to the gulags in Siberia. The most infamous war crime committed by Soviets, which I'd like to say a few words about, was killing fields in the cutting forest, which is forever written in history of Poland, became a painful wound of Polish history and memory. In, a in April 1940, 22,000 defenseless Polish prisoners from the NKWD camps and prisons Chiefly Polish army officers, Polish uh, police officers, border guards, prison and administration functionaries, priests, were killed on the order of Stalin without the trial or sentence. Their fate was covered with ominous silence. Mass death holes in Katyn, Miednoye, and Kharkov hid the truth about what had happened. The world was supposed never to learn of Katyn. Grant was meant to cover all signs of the genocide and erase from the human memory. Worth to mention tragic example of true patriotism was also the Warsaw Uprising, which began the 1st of August 1944, after five years of Warsaw occupation by the German Nazis. It takes its place in a series of uprising ending in defeat, which can be traced through Polish history. Poland wanted to demonstrate to the world that it was capable of throwing off the German oppressor on its own initiative. Young insurgents hoped for support from Allied troops. Help from outside, however, almost wholly failed to realize. For 63 days, Warsaw was the place when one can hear the sound of battle. Days full of triumph and pain, full of hope and bitter losses, but above all, full of bravery and sacrifice. In the end, almost 200,000 of Warsaw inhabitants paid for its lives. I just said about the Warsaw Uprising because this year we get a 70th anniversary of that uh, event. We, this year for Poland is very fruitful, let's say, for anniversaries, tragic anniversaries and uh, good anniversaries, so I say later about the others. Polish soldiers fought on every front of Second World War, significantly contributed to the victory of Allied troops. There were many episodes like Battle of Monte Cassino where the fame of Polish soldiers were spread worldwide, but it could be a topic for a separate lecture, I believe. Eventually, they failed, and after the Yalta Agreement, there was no free Poland, and the brutality continued as Poland remained under communist totalitarian government for over 40 next years until 1989. 
During the 10 years that separated the period between 1980 and 1990 can be considered as the real roller coaster in Poland's history. Uh, I was born in the 70s and I grew up in Poland in the 80s, so I uh, remember very good, very well that uh, there was nothing in the grocery stores. There are lines, queues of people uh, uh, staying to buy anything because there was nothing. So uh, everything was uh, uh, sold. With the, it was a special piece of paper. You have a <coughs> cartons, cartons, and with that you can buy just the uh, article for first needs: the the, the butter, the the mm, sausages, uh, everything. I uh, don't mention the, the the gas for the cars or something like that. So it was really terrible times for uh, Poland. At the start of the decade, Poland was still under the communist dictatorship and the Soviet Union. The rise of the Solidarity, the first independent trade union in Soviet bloc, became the challenge to the ruling party monopoly. The August Agreement of 1980 would mean the beginning of the end of the communist hegemony. Communist regime was so afraid of losing their power that the generals introduced the martial law on December 13, 19, uh, December 13th, uh, 1981. I remember that very well uh, because I live in the outskirts of Warsaw, uh, then close to the, uh, now there's the part of the Warsaw, that time it was just like suburbs of uh, Canadian or American city, and it was the big uh, factory, um, Ursus factory, they, uh, they produced tractors for agriculture. And it was the strike in that uh, factory. I, I live close uh, to that factory, so it was mm, endless uh, column of tanks and uh, soldiers coming, passing through our home just to surround this, uh, this factory. The period of uh, 1981 to 1988 in many ways can be considered to be the tug of war as the communist regime increased its secret police apparatus that would allow to keep communists in power and conduct surveillance of solidarity. Strikes of 1988 pushed the regime to the talks with solidarity. The historic round table talks resulted in partially free election of June 4, 1989 when Poles voted communist authoritarianism out of power and momentous changes swept through Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I was too young to vote in that uh, election. My first election, so you will know how old I am. Uh, the first election I could vote was the presidential election when I voted for like Valencia, it was 1990. After nine difficult years of martial law, Poland in 1989 became an independent country again. We had to wait several years for planted a solidarity seed of which the flower of freedom and independence blossomed for good. The breakthrough made by solidarity caused the first crack in the United Soviet bloc, marking the beginning of its end and paving the way for some of the most significant events in European and world history, such as the reunification of Germany and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The 4th of June 1989 symbolizes our victory over totalitarianism. After 40 years of communist rule, Poland was an economically and politically bankrupt country. But we have proved that with perseverance, the course of history can be changed. In August 1989, Polish parliament approved Tadeusz Mazowiecki as the first non-communist prime minister. In December of 1990, Lech Wałęsa was elected president of Poland. Poland, the largest economy among post-socialist EU member states, has just had the best 25 years in more than 1,000 years of history. For many Poles, the events of 1989 symbolized the beginning of very important economic, political, and social changes. In the last quarter of century, Poland's economy grew significantly. Since 1989, when the solidarity-led social movement spread had at the collapse of the communism, Poland's economy has grown by more than any other country in Europe. It was also one of the fastest growing economies in the world among, uh, among countries at the similar level of development. Finally, Poland was the only European economy to avoid a recession during the ongoing global crisis, continuously growing since 1992. As a result, Poland has achieved levels of income, quality of life, and well-being never experienced before. This year, GDP per capita will reach 62% of the level of income in the developed countries of Eurozone. 
After only 25 years of independence, we are proud of today's Poland. In 1989, average standard of living in Poland was barely 30% of the Western one. Nowadays, it's almost two thirds, as I mentioned. 25 years ago, we were the subject of advisory assistance and material support from the West. Now we provide support to the countries to the east and south of the EU. Poland in the European Union is not a problem, but it is part of the solution to the problems of the community. It is worth to mention that Poland achieved these accomplishments under presidents and governments from all political sides. You know, in Poland, uh, we have an election every four years parliamentary, five years presidential, so parliamentary election, except the last one, so it was from left to right, from left to right, from left to right, and even that, we achieved that. <laughs> Nevertheless, above all, the Polish accomplished it themselves with their energy, perseverance, and hard work. Thanks to the people, Poland is considered worldwide as the country of success and the example of successful transformation from dictatorship to democracy. Concentrated efforts of both socialist and liberal governments made it possible that Poland applied for full membership in the European Union and NATO. Ten years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Poland joined NATO. And in 2004, Poland cemented her place in Europe by joining the European Union. This was made possible thanks to our tremendous effort to meet the membership criteria. We became part of the union because we carried out comprehensive reforms, practically remodeling our country from the bottom up. In less than a decade, we strengthened a democracy and a free market economy, two pillars of the United Europe. Poland's accession to the EU was an enormously important event which has brought excellent results. This may be observed almost everywhere in our country, but can also be traced in the public opinion polls, which clearly show that Poles are among those European nations who pin their hopes on the EU and look to it for solution to the present problems. During the first years after our accession to the European Union, we are not present on the intellectual map of politicians from Berlin, Paris, or London. When they spoke about Europe, they always meant the countries of the old European Union. Today, when the positions of the most important European capital cities are discussed, it's completely normal that Warsaw is considered as well. For Western European politicians, we have become the intellectual and not only formal part of Europe. From a new member state, Poland has advanced into key actor in the EU with impact on the decisions that made at the European level. Polish politicians are becoming more influential figures in European Union especially with the appointment of Jerzy Buzek as European Parliament President in 2009, and recently Donald Tusk, former Prime Minister of Poland, appointed as the President of the European Council. As for Poland, it was really the age of extremes. It was the transition between democracy and dictatorship, and between freedom and tyranny. The First World War has allowed Poland to gain independence, moving forward through 20 years of freedom and in 1939 facing horrors of two totalitarian regimes, the Nazism and the Communism. Finally gaining freedom in 1989 and joining Transatlantic Security Alliance NATO in 1999 and European Union in 2004 that cemented Poland's position in Europe. As Robert Gutmann in his book rightly described, in 1980s the EU was essentially Western European that naturally looked to the West across the Atlantic. The Europe of 21st century will be based in Middle Europa, with inherent tendency to look to the East. Thank you very much. First, I want to apologize for being late. We did our best, but really, it was not possible. Too many things to do and too many much uh, traffic jam on the, on the way. I'm sorry for that. Do you hear me? Yeah? It's OK. Uh, I realize how much of our experiences with my colleagues, uh, and especially my Polish colleagues who just talked, uh, are different. Um, and I plan to start by uh, speaking about my family and I. Uh, 100 years ago, uh, there was Pierre Casabon Mazonave, who was a young shepherd in the Pyrenees uh, between France and, uh, and Spain. And uh, uh, he was my grandfather. 
and uh, he was uh, called as a soldier uh, for the at the beginning of the, the First World War. And um, there were five brothers. Two of them died. He was injured heavily. Uh, he he nailed uh, guys, and uh, he was a prisoner of war. And uh, he died uh, before being 30, leaving his uh, widow with four uh, very young children. Uh, one of them was my father. Uh, and then next generation, in 1944, uh, my father was a teenager, uh, a shepherd too, and uh, he helped uh, taking the gun, the hunting gun for against bears uh, in the mountains. He used it to help the other uh, very young and very old men, because the uh, strong men were uh, prisoners of war. Uh, he helped them to, um, to free the valley where my family is from, uh, from the few uh, German soldiers who were still there. <coughs> And then uh, he, were, he was uh, Jean-Pierre Casabon Mazonev. And then I'm, uh, I'm here, and I was, uh, when I was your age, I was a, a student and, uh, in the 80s. And uh, one summer, 80, 83, uh, eight, well, or 82, so was it something like this? Uh, when my mother was asked, uh, where is Jean-Francois? Uh, she answered, well, he's in a working camp in Germany. And <laughs> immediately <laughs> she stopped and she laughed, and uh, she, said she, she she had to explain exactly what it meant. <laughs> of course, I was a volunteer for a student camp, and we were, uh, were working. <laughs> and then there were other Europeans from uh, different countries uh, in Europe, and Germans, uh, students too, and we were uh, working with an association uh, caring for uh, disabled uh, uh, children. Uh, so in only one generation, it, it all changed, and it was so natural. So what happened during that time, in, in my view, which is on the other side of Europe, compared to, to, to Poland, of course, uh, southwest of, uh, of Europe, of uh, EU. Um, during all that time, all that 100 years, uh, France was supposed to be a democracy, a republic accepting one short period of four years, uh, from 1940 to 1944. Uh, there are discussions about the real nature of the regime, uh, the French regime at that time, under the German occupation. Um, some people say that it was really a fascist regime, uh, or some are discussing that. Some say even uh, today that that regime was uh, able to uh, we say sauver les meubles, <laughs> or save what could be uh, protected at that time of, uh, of war and uh, occupation. Uh, in my view, it was uh, obviously, in, uh, a lot con considering a lot of aspect, it was acting as a fascist regime. Uh, but uh, accepting during that short period, it was uh, France was a republic, third, fourth, and now the fifth uh, republic. Uh, and so, as I explained with my family story, uh, uh, there was huge changes, and uh, and especially uh, that feeling that uh, we didn't spoke about wars in in the, in the family, and uh, about the past. We knew it. We could have information, but that was not a topic. And uh, uh, there was a change in in, in mind, uh, so that uh, the only solution, the only way, uh, obviously, was uh, EU building the EU and building part of the this story. This incredible story, which uh, makes that uh, 100 years ago we were uh, nations fighting each other, and now we are belonging. We decided to belong uh, to the same uh, organization and to build a common, uh, a common um, uh, future. And that was obvious uh, already um, 40 or 30 years ago. It was uh, obvious in the f minds of uh, most of the people in France, not in Poland yet. <laughs> now it is, uh, probably. Um, and then today, after one hour, one uh, hundred years, one century of, of, uh, of this uh, long way, uh, EU is already uh, is again in, uh, in crisis, living in a, in a crisis, in crisis of uh, economic uh, crisis, of course, but not only, it's in crisis in these uh, institutions and in crisis uh, uh, in this will of being. Uh, and this crisis, uh, uh, as uh, incredible and horrible as it seems, uh, inside of EU today, you have 
again the the some uh, some uh, moves which are uh, looking as maybe something like uh, which could be like a dictatorship in the past uh, the evolution of the hungarian uh, of the regime in hungary uh, by example is uh, very not satisfying uh, on the democratic uh, um, uh, criteria and, uh, and in uh, all our countries you have uh, extremists who are uh, parties who are against the EU and very violent and in some countries uh, maybe is having a xenophobist uh, 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 stances uh, against the neighbors which was uh, in our man which be was belonging to the past and will never be again and this is uh, what happened during the last 20 centuries uh, last 20 years <laughs> sorry um, so what happened? What went wrong? We had that beautiful story, which started in a, a chaos of the, the end of the First World War. In some views, uh, I've heard some uh, intellectuals in France saying that the First World War and the Second World War were one single war, starting in 1914 and ending in 1945. Um, because the roots of the second conflict were uh, deep uh, connected for uh, what happened in, during the first war and uh, and what was uh, missed uh, when negotiating the, the peace in Europe. Um, but then, it, when there was this chaos, this situation, there was a generation of politicians who were able in different countries to uh, build this idea of uh, not going again in that direction. This is our. This was our last chance to do something else. Something which was in some some minds, in some dreams, uh, since the 17th century in France, in Italy, and in other uh, European countries, uh, of building a community of nations and uh, and, uh, and country. Uh, and at that time, there was a generation of politicians who were able and strong enough to build that uh, um, uh, dream. And the people, the nations, were uh, waiting for that at the same moment. When I was posted in, uh, in Japan, I've been uh, having that kind of meeting that we have today uh, with my uh, German colleagues, because we are used to, to have uh, that kind of, of uh, opportunities together. And the J Japanese uh, students uh, were asking me, us, how did you do that? And of course, what they were thinking about was uh, tell us, because it's very important for us Japanese when we are facing the Koreans or the Chinese uh, people. And uh, what they don't understand is that there was a will. First, there was a will at that time of uh, building peace and building the conditions of never having such destruction and, and wars in between our countries. And that will was shared by the politicians, or some of, some of them, a lot of them, and by the nations. And probably it's not the, the, the case yet in uh, Eastern Asia, uh, or not, uh, not enough, not, not uh, sufficiently, and especially not in the minds of the politicians uh, of that region. Uh, so the, then that, there was that building of the Western Europe, and then the Iron Curtain failed, disappeared uh, in, a, in only a few, what we saw on TV was only in a few months, in a few weeks. Of course, uh, it uh, started m much earlier, especially in, in Poland, and, uh, and uh, it was not over uh, in, in one night. Uh, but uh, we built uh, that uh, complete Europe. Uh, maybe we have to wonder about it's not the topic of the day, but exactly what is Europe and uh, which are its borders. Um, but maybe one border would be to to um, uh, unify the countries who share enough of this uh, democratic legacy, the way we, we view it in a, in a Western Europe, uh, Western including Central Europe uh, countries. Um, but even that, it's not enough, because when we see, I, I said, uh, I spoke about uh, uh, Hungary, but I could say, speak about uh, uh, Le Front National in French, a new 
kind of fascist party uh, who has a big uh, result in the elections today in France. Uh, something went wrong, and uh, part of it is uh, probably the economical situation. Another reason is that our politicians and our elites, and not only the politicians, uh, forgot that dream of uh, and that responsibility we have toward the past and toward the future and the next generation. Uh, and probably uh, we considered uh, uh, that while it's done, we don't have to fight anymore for democracy. Uh, we don't have to fight anymore for Europe. Uh, and we have to care about something else. And maybe to, for finishing the, my, my, my speech or my commentaries, I, I just go back to one century ago, Pierre Casabon Mazonave. He, he was not in a, in a poor family, but really his life was very, very much different from mine, of course. Uh, even education, even people were educated in southwest of France, but uh, not too much. There were peasants. Of course, I'm not speaking about help. Uh, uh, in the end, only one of my great uncles survived, and uh, I, I knew him on, on five brothers. Two died in, uh, in war, one because of injured, and the fourth one because of, uh, of his help. Uh, it's not the case anymore. We have a much better life. Uh, which is part of the of this building of uh, building a democratic Europe, uh, and we forgot all of this. And so, I would say in the end, and it's not too much uh, optimistic, that uh, we thought that the story was from war and dictatorship to democracy and Europe and freedom. And it, maybe it's not that simple. And uh, Canada last week. Uh, uh, was facing uh, the, the attacks of uh, of terrorists on his uh, on his ground, and two soldiers are are, are, are dead. So we know in France that uh, history is a tragedy, and we never have to forget that uh, in order to to fight for our uh, democracy, for our freedom, uh, and this is what uh, reminds us the tragedy of last week in uh, in Canada too. So this is uh, my conclusion here. It's a, a never-ending story. We have to fight every week, every day, and never thinking that it's uh, it's done and we we, we, we can go on with uh, uh, not fighting for for the legacy we received from the previous generations. Thank you. I hope we will have a lot of questions from you because that's the best part of the of the meeting in my view. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm number three, and I was just wondering, would I have said, or would my grandfather or my great grandfather have sat with a Polish and a French a colleague uh, on uh, the dais a hundred years ago? There was no Poland a no. hundred years ago. And France was the app find, uh, the hereditary enemy of Germany. And uh, so it would have been quite unlikely that we would have sat uh, at one table facing young students. Uh, when I look at Germany, or when you like, think of Germany, and you imagine being in space, looking down at the map of Europe, uh, you would see that Germany is the country in Europe uh, with the most neighbors. We are in the heart of Europe, and we have nine neighbors. I was just counting. It's true. It's starting with Denmark in the north, and it's going down to Austria, Switzerland in, in, in the south, and uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg in the west. So uh, we have a lot of relations, a lot of bilateral relations. And being in the heart of Europe means that uh, Everybody's biography is crisscrossing Europe. And just as uh, Jean-Francois was mentioning his family, I would like to share some thoughts with you about my family, because it is enlightening in understanding German history and uh, European history. Of, my, of the parents of my father, uh, my grandfather, 
uh, comes from a family that emigrated from uh, Austria in 1731-32 when Maria Theresia was expelling uh, the Lutheran Protestants. So they moved from Austria, from Salzburg, to Eastern Prussia, attracted by uh, Frederick William I, uh, the King of Prussia, who was trying to attract settlers. So they went across Europe. Uh, my grandmother was more, uh, more rooted. Uh, she lived in Alsace. Her family lived in Alsace, what is now France. And uh, she uh, came from an old farmer's family, uh, and they grew some wine. And they lived well in the wonderful Alsace region. Uh, my, the father of my mother came from Silesia, uh, from Breslau, what is now Wroclaw, and uh, they uh, migrated before the First World War already to, uh, to the region of Darmstadt, where I was born. And uh, there my, uh, my grandfather father found and married uh, a local woman, my grandmother. So these four uh, came from different regions of Europe, what is now France, what is now Poland, and uh, they, uh, therefore, I couldn't say I'm German, I'm a mixture of Europe, I'm a European. And uh, the history of these, uh, fami uh, these family members are uh, also exemplifying uh, the events of dictatorship and democracy uh, in Europe during the last 100 years. Starting with my grandfather, uh, the father of my mother, going to war uh, in the First World War. And afterwards he said, oh, uh, the war was uh, kind of a vacation for me uh, because he had been working so hard to set up his existence that he was coughing blood before uh, being drawn to the army and uh, experiencing the war in another way. Then uh, the 1920s, 30s, well, I should uh, add my grandfather, father of my father, he was working for the German Reichsbahn, the railways, and he was living in Metz, what is now France as well. And my father was born in Metz in 1911, and uh, the uh, after the war, 1918, uh, the French railways asked my father, uh, my grandfather, are you going to uh, work for the SNCF or are you going, do you want to continue working for the Reichsbahn? He said, I want to work for the Reichsbahn. So he had to leave Metz and he moved to Darmstadt uh, where the family settled. Uh, my grandmother was always disappointed because she said life was so much better in, uh, in Alsace than in Darmstadt. Why do I have to live he here? And my sister once said when she went on vacation with my grandmother, oh, uh, I have never seen uh, our grandmother as happy as she was when she came back to Alsace. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, the economic crisis set in, and um, my father was by then uh, late 20s, he had passed his uh, abitur, his, you know, uh, his school graduation, he started studying, and together with his friends, uh, they graduated eventually, and they were stuck in the economic crisis. Uh, I remember my, my godfather, he had three brothers, the four didn't have work. So that was the situation that partly contributed to the rise of Hitler, and uh, even though everybody uh, was a resistance fighter in uh, looking back at German history, uh, my father was a party member and he put hope into uh, the rise of Hitler. Uh, he was one of those technocrats uh, who said, well, uh, we want to, to build a new country, and they failed. And uh, he uh, went into war and was captured by the Russians, returned from Russian captivity, uh, during that time, uh, Darmstadt was destroyed in the bombing war. And then we had 1949, uh, the founding of uh, a new Germany, the German Federal Republic. And I was born in 1953, and I was called the prosperity baby. Because uh, that was the time when Germany was reconstructing 
with the help of uh, the American support, the Marshall Plan, and Germany was climbing out of the rubble, and we were trying to, uh, not we, I wasn't able to do that at the time, uh, but the generation of my parents was trying to, to find a new way into the future, and this new way consisted of several elements. One element was the economic miracle that produced me. Uh, my uh, brother and sister were always envious because I grew up when my parents already had a car. Before that, uh, uh, holidays were on bicycle. Uh, so that was uh, a big advance. Uh, we built a house and moved into a house, uh, big advance. So I was growing up in a prospering Germany and uh, Germany that was becoming an economic giant and a political dwarf. But I'll come to that later. But this political dwarf with limited um, uh, sovereignty uh, knew one thing. Uh, we have to decide uh, where we want to stand. And the decision was to stand with the West. And that was the West orientation that Konrad Adenauer, as Chancellor of Germany at the time, was initiating. And the most important uh, uh, element of this West orientation was uh, to come to terms with France and to end the centuries of enmity that had prevailed between Germany and France, uh, the struggle over which uh, eastern border France and western border Germany would have. And it meant that uh, Alsace-Lorraine, the, uh, the object of so much fighting over the centuries, was recognized as being part of France, and that was it. And I think that was an extremely important uh, step to uh, when uh, 50 years ago, no, it's now 52 years ago, uh, uh, Chancellor Arno and uh, President Charles de Gaulle went to Reims, a cathedral, to the cathedral that was destroyed by Germany during the First World War, and to have a joint mass, to attend a joint mass in the cathedral. So that was West orientation uh, and uh, the uh, membership in NATO that came for Poland uh, 50 years later, uh, and uh, the partnership with the United States and uh, the start of European integration. But that was looking West. Germany is, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, sitting in the center of Europe, and it doesn't have only Western neighbors, it has also Eastern neighbors. And uh, after the Second World War, uh, Germany lost parts of its territory in the East. And uh, if I recall it correctly, Stalin at the, at the time said, well, the move of Poland from East to West, Poland lost territory in the East and uh, uh, got territory in the West, formerly German uh, territory, Stalin said, this move is going to assure for eternity hostility between uh, Poland and Germany. And uh, uh, this certainty uh, got its first uh, chink in the armor, so to speak, uh, when Willy Brandt uh, traveled to Poland, to Warsaw in 1990, and kneeled in, uh, at the Warsaw uh, Ghetto Memorial. And uh, that was the start and the time of the Ostpolitik, uh, the effort to slowly uh, reduce confrontation, block confrontation between, between East and West, and uh, find a way uh, to move to more cooperation. It was an extremely slow and difficult process, negotiations with Poland, uh, with Russia particularly, uh, with uh, the Czech Republic, uh, with uh, East Germany. Uh, but it was a process that developed its own dynamics, and it was fostered by the uh, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, particularly uh, the 
uh, human and human rights dimension of it. That was a reference point for the opposition in, uh, in uh, Eastern Germany and Eastern European countries. So it was a very important uh, uh, development that culminated in the uh, Anus Mirabilis uh, in the uh, lucky year of 1989 when in uh, Eastern Europe, starting with Poland, in Hungary, in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, the uh, Iron Curtain that had fallen after the war uh, was rising again, unexpectedly, I can tell you. I. Uh, I was uh, con uh, working at the embassy in, uh, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, in 19, from 1988 to 1990. And in 1989, uh, we had the visit of a German member of parliament who came uh, to deliver speeches uh, uh, and, uh, at, um, on the uh, 17th of June, that is the... Uh, a memorial day for the uprising in Eastern Germany in 1953. And uh, we were talking and uh, he, uh, he said, uh, well, uh, ask me uh, if I believed in German uh, reunification. And I said, well, I think it is quite unlikely. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, uh, would <laughs> need major changes. And I said, if we came so far that we would have uh, the same access, uh, the same um, uh, travel opportunities as with Austria, this would already be something uh, I would be happy about. And he said, well, are you traveling to Eastern Germany? And I said, I have been to East Berlin, but not to, uh, to uh, the other parts of uh, uh, Eastern Germany. And he said, if you talk to the people there, a lot of them want reunification, and that came about 1989, 1990. Uh, and uh, this was a miraculous year. And when we celebrate uh, our National Day, we do not celebrate it on the 9th of November when uh, the wall came down, because the 9th of November in German history is an extremely difficult day. 9th of November 1918, was uh, the uh, German Republic that was proclaimed after the, um, the Kaiser stepped down. 9 of November 1938 was uh, Reichskristallnacht, the start of the extermination of Jews in Europe. And it would have been very inappropriate to have a German National Day and celebrate on that day. And that brings me to, uh, to another aspect of uh, or another legacy, I should, I should say, of the last century, and that is uh, the Holocaust that is, uh, uh, I would say, forever uh, burdening our conscience, but also our, uh, the image that you have of Germany, because it's not only Goethe in Weimar, but it's also the concentration camp in Buchenwald. So that is an extremely difficult legacy, and for all these reasons, I mentioned, uh, uh, I mentioned West orientation, I mentioned the integration, uh, the outreach to, uh, to the East. Uh, for all these reasons, uh, European integration is for us the answer because uh, we, we understand uh, that uh, uh, the developments of uh, the 20th century were leading for the first half into the wrong direction, and uh, uh, the answer could only be uh, integration. And that was one of the motivations, or that was the motivation that was driving Helmut Kohl, that was driving Mitterrand, uh, that was driving uh, the Polish, uh, uh, should I say, revolutionaries uh, who were uh, trying to find their way to Europe. And uh, today, uh, the generations are changing. Our son is, uh, is now uh, turning 25. He was born not on the 9th of November 1989, but on the 24th of November 1989. He grew up in a united Germany. He grew up in a united Europe. He grew up in a Europe with a, with a euro as a, as a currency. And all the experiences that I was mentioning, the experience of his great-grandparents, uh, of his 
grandparents, my experience growing up uh, during the Cold War is very distant to him. He may see uh, globalization as a, as a reason for European integration, uh, but uh, uh, he doesn't have this memory of enmity between Germany and France or uh, the Cold War between Germany, between West, the West and the East, which was uh, uh, mostly happening on the border between uh, uh, the two Germanys. Uh, he is looking at another future, and thank God I can only say. Let me add one uh, other point. Uh, I mentioned that as a consequence of the Second World War and uh, German-French reconciliation, uh, the western border of Germany was settled as it is now. Uh, but I should also mention that in the course of uh, German reunification in 1989-1990, the eastern border of Germany was settled for one, once and for all along the oder Neisse line. And uh, I think that was proving uh, Stalin wrong, wrong when he thought that uh, there would be eternal German-Polish enmity. And that means that now we, are can, can, we can sit together here as friends. And I think that is the important outcome of this desolate 20th century. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, start off by thanking uh, my co-panelists here for uh, braving the 401 to get here tonight. Uh, very kind of them to, to take the time out of their schedule. And uh, thanking Professor Schultz as well for bringing this event together. I was happy to hear from some of my co-panelists as they talked about the present and some of the developments in Europe, what's going on in the European Union today. Uh, I've limited my comments to the past. Historians, as you probably know, don't like the present very much. <laughs> So I will just uh, talk about what I think are some of the consequences of World War I as they <coughs> happened uh, 100 years ago. So we join today with the many other universities, communities, and nations who are recognizing the 100th anniversary of World War I. Or to be more precise, we are recognizing the outbreak of that cataclysmic event. Over the next four years, we, are, we will be commemorating uh, the war's major battles, and then our centenary memorial events will end in 2018 when we recognize the 100th anniversary of the armistice. We now know, of course, the sequence of events that followed the outbreak of the war, but it is worth recalling in this year, when we think back not to the end of the war but to its beginning, that the historical actors in 1914 did not know the outcome of their actions or, in certain cases, of their inept bungling. The war was not over by Christmas. The euphoria that accompanied its announcement soon evaporated. When Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, and the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph I signed the mobilization orders, they could not know that they would be ending not only their own reign, but that of their monastic dynasties. This is perhaps the first point on which we might reflect, and one which I believe has relevance as much today as it did 100 years ago. Wars take on a life of their own. Their consequences cannot be known in advance. World War I intensified an issue that had been plaguing Europe for more than a century, one which would not be resolved until very recent times. And we heard a bit about this in the previous speaker. The answer to the question, where is Germany, had proved a vexing one. It was Napoleon who opened this can of worms with his defeat of Germany in 1806 and reorganization of the Germanic states. The Holy Roman Empire of the German nation was a messy conglomeration of hundreds of states and one whose complicated system of electors still confounds constitutional experts, but at least its borders were static and had been for centuries. Observers were not always sure what the Holy Roman Empire was, but they did know where it was. That changed with Napoleon and shaped much of the 19th century. Whether the Germans of Austria formed part of Germany was resolved in 1866 during the German Civil War, but as we know, it was not a permanent resolution. In 1938, Hitler's Germany united with Austria in what many considered the righting of a historical wrong. 
With the founding of the German Empire in 1871, Germany's borders should have been solidified, but they seemed more fluid than they had since the Napoleonic invasions. It could safely be assumed, even without the advantage of hindsight, hindsight that France would not accept the annexation of Alsace and Lorraine. World War I changed Germany's borders again. Not only did Germany lose its modest colonial empire, the Treaty of Versailles radically changed its territory in Europe. Germany lost more than 64,000 square kilometers of land, most of it resource rich, and nearly 6.5 million people, about half of them German speaking. Despite the laudable efforts of the diplomats in Paris in 1919, the Polish corridor was a terribly awkward solution. The eastern boundary of Germany would be a fraught topic for years to come. Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor of West Germany, was known to say when he crossed the Elbe River into the eastern parts of Germany, ah, I'm back in Asia. <laughs> Adenauer's fantasies aside, it was not clear to scholars, diplomats, or even those who lived in the region where in the east exactly Germany came to an end. The outcome of World War I gave, Ger gave cause to Germany to address the boundaries issue anew which Hitler did even prior to the Second World War with the Sudetenland, Austria, Memo, and the Saarland, although I should say that the Saarland was uh, governed by the League of Nations. World War II did little to settle Germany's borders. As Poland was physically shifted to the west and the division of Germany took hold, almost none of Germany's borders were ideal. In the west, France wanted as much a buffer as possible. In the east, the Oder River with Poland seemed makeshift. The border between East and West Germany seemed anything but permanent, even after the Berlin Wall was built. Divided Germany, for example, competed as one team at the Olympics in 1964, three years after the construction of the Berlin Wall. Even during the process of German unification in 1989 and 1990, the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl publicly questioned the permanency of Germany's border with Poland, causing an outcry that forced him to recognize Germany's eastern border. And as we heard, I think uh, it's fair to say that this issue, 200 years in the making, has finally been resolved. It is impossible to talk about World War I without discussing those ideologies that benefited most from it, communism and fascism. The rise of these ideologies was not preordained, but it is certainly true that neither the Bolshevik rise in Russia, nor Mussolini's rise in Italy, nor Hitler's in Germany is conceivable without World War I. Ian Kershaw, the great historian of the Nazi era, has said, World War I made Hitler possible. This was true on many levels. It not only provided Hitler himself with the experience of life in the trenches and the notion of sacrifice for nation, which he so romanticized, it provided him with the personal experience of defeat. The news of the armistice communicated to him by a nurse in a military hospital in East Prussia, where he lay, eyes bandaged, convalescing from a mustard gas attack. His army affiliation continued after the war. During those first violent years of the Weimar Republic, the army turned to him to spy on early political formations in Munich, one of which was the German Workers' Party. He would eventually join the party, which was the object of his investigations, become its leader, and change its name to the more familiar National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party. It was Karl Marx who famously said, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Mm. Hitler certainly made his own history, but the circumstances were bequeathed to him from World War I. The Treaty of Versailles had not only provided him with territorial grievances, it had offered up the equally ire-inducing war guilt clause, which assigned blame for those devastating four years to the Germans. Historians differ as to whether the Treaty of Versailles was as harsh as some, including Hitler, claimed, pointing as a comparator to the shockingly harsh peace of Brest-Litovsk, which Germany foisted on Russia in 1917. But the war guilt clause was something new. All European nations had considered war to be a legitimate tool to resolve disputes, and the treaties that ended them sought to share the spoils or redistribute, redistribute the pawns in the great game of diplomacy. But they didn't assign guilt. The Treaty of Versailles in making a moral judgment on the German nation was unprecedented. 
The war also provided Hitler with the social upheaval of which his party could take advantage. Inflation ran rampant in the early 1920s, rendering the German mark a plaything for children and fuel for private fireplaces. And violence was nearly a daily event, not least due to the masses of demobilized soldiers. There were over, there were over 350 political murders in the interwar period, including the much admired foreign minister, Walter Rathenau. Things stabilized in the later 1920s, but Hitler was still able to tap into people's memories of the nascent democracy as lawless and economically weak. The turmoil and mounting losses of World War I spelled the end of the Romanov dynasty in Russia and facilitated the seizure of power by the Bolsheviks. Even more so than Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union would come to embody the concept of totalitarianism. The Bolsheviks' unwavering belief in their ideology led them to conclude that the ends justified the means, even when the means were the murder of vast numbers of humans. The idea that terror can be justified when one is on the right side of history is not new, of course, but something that was part and parcel of religious wars and of the French Revolution. What was new, however, is that in the aftermath of World War I, there arose a bureaucratization of violence. The apartchik, the ideologue come civil servant, became as important a cog in the machinery of violence as the grassroots perpetrator. Hannah Arendt, in her book on Adolf Eichmann, spoke of the banality of evil. Faceless bureaucrats who organized train schedules without much concern about the fate of those in the transports, without really any ill will toward Jews. We now know that Hannah Arendt was dead wrong. The bureaucracies of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were rife with servants of the regime who believed in the elimination of enemies. They were the ones who would have echoed the Italian fascist slogan, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. They were the desk murderers made famous by the Holocaust historian Raoul Hilberg. The idea of a second 30 years war, which we heard from my French colleague, between 1914 and 1945 was first proposed by Charles de Gaulle uh, while in exile and popularized in the 1950s. Although the two world wars account for only 10 years of that 30 year period, the interior, interwar period could hardly be said to be peaceful as the Russian Civil War, the Polish-Soviet Polish War, the Greco-Turkish War, and the Spanish Civil War all attest. The Italian fascists and the German Nazis also brought violence to the main streets of their countries. As time marches on, I expect that the two world wars will be seen as a continuum. We have speculated for some time now that there was indeed a continuism, continuum of violence. In the First World War, killing on a shockingly large scale soon shocked few. The Battle of Champagne that began in December 1914 saw 140,000 deaths in three months. American losses in the Vietnam War, as a point of comparison, were 60,000 over the course of some 13 years. World War I saw an obscene encroachment of war into all aspects of human life. Eric Hobsbawm famously characterized World War I as, I quote, a machine for brutalizing the world, unquote, brilliantly capturing the clinical manner by which the West turned its penchant for technological progress into <coughs> utter destruction. But something else happened to humanity in those four years between 1914 and 1918. Civilization had been derailed. The genie had been let out of the bottle. The huge casualties witnessed in World War I seemed to set a new and much, much lower bar for humanity, one that opened people's eyes to the possibility of mass death. The film of memory of those deaths continued to run in the minds of Europeans long after the war had ended. Gunter Grass, in his novel Crab Walk, writes, besides, numbers don't mean much. The ones with lots of zeros can't be grasped. It is because of World War I that the numbers with lots of zeros don't mean much to us anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, since we started a little later, I think we do have a couple of minutes for questions and comments. So the floor is yours. Perhaps directly one of the speakers or all of them with questions. <laughs> I'm another historian, I can do that. So my question is for the consuls general. All three of you, in various ways, emphasize, really stress the importance of European integration. And all three of you, in one way or another, talk about the fluidity of the eastern borders. So in light of those two key points, I'd love to know what you think of the implications of the Ukraine and the Crimea. <laughs> Was the question audible, or do you want me to repeat it? Do we have to say it? Audible? Good. Who would like to start? Poland is good. <laughs> <laughs> you had the longest rest. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Poland, like other uh, European countries, every European country, we support Ukrainian. Uh, mm, uh, Ukrainian fight for freedom and for the independence. We are uh, one of the first countries which support Ukrainians with their path to the uh, to the Western uh, world and European Union. Uh, Uk Ukraine is uh, it is it's very hard time for the Ukraine. Everybody knows that Ukraine is uh, at the point when Poland was 25 years ago. Is the the country is bankrupt. We it is the very huge corruption. Uh, so it is very similarity. And after 25 years, we choose the Western uh, style of living, and we go to the West, uh, Western European uh, countries, European Union. We we introduce, as I said before, as I mentioned, comprehensive reforms, and we are now a fully democratic uh, country. So there is a hope for Ukraine if they introduce so it is the election. Uh, two days ago, and uh, uh, it's shown to everybody that the Ukraine uh, chose the Western ways. So there is the hope for Ukraine that uh, uh, that after 20 years, because the, 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 this process is not very quick process. They, it is very difficult for the people, and they must understand that if they want to have a, a, the level of living close to the Western uh, countries, it, is, it will be a very hard time. It was the same in Poland before. So it is about the Ukraine. And uh, if I may add uh, the one, um, uh, one event, I didn't mention that in my speech, and the Consul Stechel and others said about the uh, borders moving after the Second World War. And there was a one episode in the history that is concerned to our three countries, the Poland, Germany, and French. In 1952 or 53, I don't recall uh, um, exactly, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, paid a visit to Poland. And one of the places is the city of Zabrze. It is Silesian city. And former, before the Second World War, it was a German city. And uh, Charles de Gaulle in the city of Zabrze said that the, he paid a visit also to the other cities and one of the places, so not very important place, but what he said was very important. Because he said that uh, the Zabrze is a very Silesian city and that means it is very Polish city. So his words confirmed to the West that the Silesia now it was 52 or 53, so it's a couple of years after the war. The Silesia is the uh, part of Poland now. And the, the, this, this city is very known for the, what Charles de Gaulle said and also for uh, Górnik Zabrze, the soccer club, nothing else. <laughs> it's minor Zabrze. So uh, going to the Ukraine, as I said, difficult times. Uh, we support every. Every 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 thing the Ukrainians do to go to the uh, Western uh, uh, society, but first they have to introduce uh, comprehensive reforms to be on that path. So after the election, they are on that path. So let's see what will be the next. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Uh, if I may uh, add a couple of comments also on the issue of European integration. Uh, a 
apart from thinking when you mentioned uh, Charles de Gaulle in Poland, I thought of Charles de Gaulle in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, <laughs> so many famous uh, speeches he delivered. Uh, but European integration and the question of Ukraine, uh, where does Europe end, the eastern border of, uh, of uh, Europe? Uh, it's not up to me to determine this, but uh, I would uh, like to refer the dis to the discussion about uh, expansion and deep uh, expanding the European Union and deepening the European Union, which is an eternal one. And uh, in the past uh, 20 years, uh, the European Union has, no, yeah, 25 years after 1989, the European Union has expanded tremendously and looking at the Balkans, it has uh, a very important role in uh, providing the incentive to uh, the countries to reform, uh, to, uh, to change their legal system, to democratize and approach Europe. Uh, so that is uh, expanding. But we are certainly uh, facing the question, how far do we expand? Turkey is a case in point. Uh, Ukraine is a case in point. And uh, I wouldn't be able to say uh, what we think about it 25 years from now, but it's going to be a long, long process. And with every expansion of the European Union, uh, the, uh, the hesitation grew uh, to add even more members. And I think there will be many steps of uh, of approaching the European Union, of uh, establishing a common market as we do uh, cooperation agreements as we have them with Ukraine before we think about outright uh, membership. And the second aspect is deepening what we have. And the uh, monetary, uh, the euro crisis of the last years and the consequences of it, the efforts to, uh, to deal with it, show how difficult deepening is. Because going each step that we proceed uh, in the process of further European integration means that the participating states, uh, participating countries, nations, have to accept uh, losses of sovereignty. And that is extremely difficult because you have to justify it uh, to your voters. Uh, it's not a country that is emerging out of self-selected immigrants like ca uh, Canada or the United States. It's uh, a continent with countries with a long history, with a uh, strong culture, religion, and everything. And you have to come to a com common understanding and say, OK, we accept that somebody from Brussels is going to tell us how our budget should look like, how we uh, construct our pension system, uh, how we open our markets. And that is cutting very deep. And uh, I think we are in a, in a very difficult and long-lasting process of really pursuing this integration. And uh, sometimes I feel we are in the middle of the river and we have to construct the second part of the bridge to come to the other uh, bank. But it's going to be a very long and difficult construction. Thank you. Um, on the question of uh, Ukraine, um, I, I, I said just before that uh, we should never forget that uh, history is a tragedy. And this is typically one example, a good example, when where Europe forgot that. We thought that, uh, I, I described the fact that maybe the dangers against democracy in Europe today are inside of our, our own countries, inside of our own political life. Uh, but it is on our border too. And uh, we thought that it was done. We were living in a quiet region. Some uh, American uh, a uh, historian, or so to say, uh, Mr. Fukushima so, uh, said that it was the end of the history. Of course, he stopped that. <laughs> he changed his mind since. Yeah. And, uh, and we were in that mind, and so in that mind, we didn't need to have uh, armies, strong armies. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to buy weapons. And Mr. Putin knows that. And uh, if there's one uh, very good uh, lesson to learn on that, is that the uh, European Union should stop to rely on uh, the USA or another ally 
uh, for its own security. It doesn't mean that the USA are not our ally. We are allied and we are fighting on different fields of war today. But this is not enough for the security of Europe. We have to take care of our own. And we, we, are, we were too weak to react the way we, we, we should have reacted uh, after what happened in Crimea and in, uh, in, in Ukraine today. Uh, uh, regarding the question of uh, uh, borders, just one uh, short story. We spoke, we heard about uh, Alsace and Lorraine uh, several times. So I have to tell you that uh, in French, the Alsacian uh, people from Alsace, when they speak about the other regions of France, they speak about la France de l'intérieur, which means the France of the inside. <laughs> so they consider themselves as French, but from the outside. <laughs> So there's still a border, <laughs> but we, we have found the, way, the words to uh, just to, to have ideas on that and, and no more wars. Uh, the borders of uh, EU, I mentioned that uh, issue uh, right before. In the 90s, uh, in the 80s and 90s, we were in the illusion that, uh, in my view, it's an illusion, that uh, the EU is a juridic uh, construction um, constructed on laws. Um, and that uh, history and geography do not really matter. And in that regard, mm -hmm. of course, Ukraine and, uh, and Turkey should be a member of the, the EU. Uh, let me remind you that, uh, uh, especially from, uh, from uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, Great Britain uh, and uh, the USA, uh, there was a huge pressure for uh, um, the EU to have the Turkey uh, inside of, uh, of our community. Uh, as it is inside the um, uh, military organization of NATO. And see, uh, look at your newspaper today, the situation in the Middle East and the role uh, Turkey is playing uh, today in that situation. It's certainly not uh, uh, confirm of what the European uh, uh, want and promote uh, in terms of uh, democracy and peace. Um, and um, on the other side, I've been living in uh, two other countries uh, who were, uh, as well as uh, Turkey, in a good position, uh, as well and not more than uh, or less than uh, Turkey, in a position to be candidate for uh, entering the EU uh, in terms of the uh, economical situation, in terms of law, in terms of civil rights, which uh, have to be improved in those two countries, uh, as well as in uh, Turkey today. And when I was living there, I was thinking, why not this country? And uh, why should Turkey be in, in uh, Europe and the EU and not this country where I'm living? One of these countries is, Tur is Tunisia. It was before the revolution. And the other country is Japan. <laughs> <laughs> just, just think about Japan. What is Japan today? It has a lot of, in everyday life of uh, Japanese people, has a lot of to do with the uh, everyday life of European people. I, I, can, I can discuss that very really precisely on a lot of issues. But of course, it's a joke. <laughs> Japan will never be a member of the EU. But if the EU is just a uh, construction based on law and rationality, why not Japan? <laughs> and why not Turkey, of course? Oh, it's, uh, so the answer is somewhere yeah. else. And uh, uh, Walter was uh, mentioning that, that discussion between deepening and uh, uh, enlarging uh, the EU. Uh, we probably since the 90s, uh, we probably did not work enough on those uh, two issues and uh, relied too much on, on uh, regulations and laws. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? I just have a comment. Uh, I like your comment in particular that you are, uh, when you mention Europe as a integrated Europe should stand together and find strength together without relying on outside. Because certainly when you look at that situation, right now, with an integrated Europe, all those people that were displaced <coughs> after the Second World War, where we have people here in, in this country and all over the place in South, South America, all have a chance now to go back to the country of their roots and visit at least without threat of being punished or persecuted and that type of thing. Uh, I am coming from a family, my grand, great-grandfather worked for the Tsar. Mm -hmm. My 
my wife's parents uh, were born in, uh, my wife's ancestors were born in Ukraine, Poland, and Austria, but all in the same village. <laughs> <laughs> and, but now it is possible for us to travel. And I'm really scared that um, when we're talking about um, genocides, that uh, politicians concentrate on the Holocaust and make that the sample. That's a very good reminder for the German people, obviously. But there's the Holodomor, where Ukrainians got killed. The, the, Polish, the Polish ambassador referred to genocide in Poland. There is all over the world, in the Middle East right now, uh, genocide, terrible genocides in Africa, terrible genocides. And politicians, I hope, will be able to find a way to distance themselves from that kind of approach to politics. Because when we look at the Ukraine, uh, United Europe, again, there is all kinds of dangers to that from the outside with the with the wars and the fringes in uh, in Ukraine and in in Turkey with Turkey and the deepening um, of the union when we travel to Europe uh, to Turkey and uh, Greece two years ago the travel consultant the travel guide told us Germany right now is approaching or is into a third world war, an economic war against Turkey. And that happened half an hour after the same lady showed us a village that was um, renovated with EU monies and said, oh yeah, we won the prize for the best uh, mm -hmm. renovation of the village with EU money, and then at the same time she turned around to the EU and said, they are waging war on us. That is the challenge from inside in Europe. So I'm scared for Europe, but I hope that we're gonna get someplace to a place where Europe can be in a place that Canada was, in a way, uh, in a little bit of uh, wonderland, no wars, no threats. <laughs> I know it will be impossible, but nevertheless, it's a comment. Okay, thank you. I don't know, do you want to react Maybe to the just, comment? Just a uh, short react. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I spoke about tragedy, I don't really believe in Wonderland. <laughs> uh, but I'm not uh, pessimistic to, uh, neither. Uh, when you consider the Ukrainian crisis and the uh, behavior of uh, Russia, of uh, Russian leaders, uh, um, they have never been willing to do a total war, uh, as we had in the past in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and he, they are much more uh, careful, and uh, and um, they are now now looking. Maybe my colleagues would not uh, agree, but they are now looking for uh, an issue to that situation, um, considering that they probably have uh, um, uh, obtained the, the, their main uh, gains, the main uh, uh, targets they were uh, looking for. Um, but uh, it has never been a question of a total war, uh, of a total domination of another country. Uh, that's what I mean. And uh, in that regard, it's uh, conflicts are much uh, less important uh, level than were the, the or are the conflicts in the Middle East, by example, uh, today. Uh, it's much more local war, in my in my view. But that doesn't change one thing in what I said. We European we were not and we are still not ready to face that kind of uh, situation and to react to the way we would like to react. Mm, that's a that's a when the borders first became so free in Europe and, and 
did someone go on a crazy trip with a as many countries in one day? I know I tried to get off France, Switzerland, and Germany through, but um, just any thoughts about how, how open the borders can be um, compared to how they were uh, what you grew up with. Maybe you would like to come. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. There is no border control between the countries uh, of the European Union. Uh, when we enter, when we um, entered the Schengen zone, it was not very shocking for Poland because the the after after 1990, so it was uh, much easier to travel for Polish people than before. So before, really, it was uh, it was not. Ob for, for you, for you are living in Canada, so for you there is obvious you can apply for a passport. There is not so obvious in Poland uh, in 1980s. So it was the, the passport was the privilege and not everybody can get it. And there are two kinds of passports for uh, Eastern countries and Western countries. And get that one to travel to the Western countries, it was a miracle. And um, I once uh, passed the, so, and the border between the, for example, the Poland and East Germany, it was just a regular border yeah, like uh, uh, between the Canada and the US today. And I've been in 86, as I believe, in Switzerland, and we passed the East German border to West German border. And that was not the regular border. So the traveling, it, it was the Iron Curtain, and it was the, I don't know, 10 kilometers both sides. There was totally nothing, just mining the fields and uh, the tanks uh, uh, all over the world. The world, uh, I mean the path, you, you, you coming by the car. Uh, so it was not uh, so easy. Uh, and uh, now, uh, now it's, uh, it's very easy. So. <clears throat> Uh, we, um, even uh, in our Polish consulates, we experience uh, a lot of people, the Polish, the people from the Polish descent are coming for the European passport for our office. They mean every country issued their own passports, right? The Polish passports uh, is considered as the European passport. Just to uh, free travel across the Europe and um, and to the other countries that the European Union citizens do not need a visa, uh, so um, uh, there is uh, there is really there's one of the advantage the free movement of the people between countries is one of the advantage uh, to to be in the European Union, and uh, it is as I say very easy to travel to 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 to, to everywhere. So thank you. If you want to add something. Uh, just uh, a personal experience uh, traveling in earlier times and now. Uh, in 1975, I was going bicycling down the Danube from uh, the Black Forest in Germany uh, to the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, going from uh, Germany to Austria, that didn't mean anything. Uh, there was a sleep, maybe not even a sleepy uh, customs agent uh, sitting there. Uh, but then uh, going into Hungary at the time uh, was uh, a major undertaking. And I remember uh, a couple of kilometers behind the border uh, when all of a sudden somebody was jumping out of the ditch and uh, stopping me. And I still don't know if it was a secret agent man or uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, but it became really difficult crossing into Romania. And uh, they would have loved to take my bicycle apart because uh, they thought somebody must be crazy and he must be smuggling drugs or whatever in, uh, in, the, uh, in the frame. Uh, but that is uh, the memory of a distant path. Uh, if our son were, uh, were doing something, something like that today and he was traveling by uh, U-Rail with a U-Rail pass, there is nothing, and sometimes you're wondering, am I already in France? Am I already in, uh, in Denmark? And uh, I think that is easily taken for granted, and uh, nobody is uh, appreciating it anymore because it's the new normal. And uh, that is a pity because we should uh, see how far we have come and uh, wonder how we can advance. Maybe one, one short memory for 
for me it was in, in Germany in 1989, in June 1999. Uh, I was a young diplomat and I was visiting a friend who, uh, who was working in the French government in uh, Western Berlin. And uh, we were supposed to go in uh, Eastern Berlin to, to watch an opera. And uh, we had a, a young French soldier in the, in the back of the car. He was maybe 18 or something like this. He was the most scared of the three of us <laughs> with his gun. And um, and uh, never been in an opera. And uh, and we, we it was June at the end of, uh, of the afternoon, a beautiful day. And uh, we go through the border at Checkpoint Charlie. I don't know if you know it, but it's a very historical uh, and important place, a gate, a closed gate between uh, uh, East and West uh, during the, the Cold War. And we were in that place, uh, which was supposed to disappear a few months later, but we didn't know at that time. And um, uh, maybe some of you noticed that I have a very long name. And at that time, the diplomatic passport was handwritten. <laughs> And we did, the diplomats didn't want the Russian army to take our passport, diplomatic passport, because they would stamp it with something I don't remember what. But we didn't want this. It was a question of uh, recognition of uh, something or what. And so the idea was to show the diplomatic passport through the glass of the, of the window of the, of the car uh, which, without opening it. And the poor Russian soldier was trying to write my name on a paper. And uh, of course, he could not do it because uh, it's too long. It's too complicated. It was handwritten. And it lasted minutes and minutes. And the young friend, uh, French soldier was carrying in the back. My friend, she was uh, completely uh, uh, nervous. I don't know, uh, historical, something like this. <laughs> and I was the only one to laugh. <laughs> So in the end, we, we went. Uh, it, uh, it was okay, and we just went to the to the to the opera uh, and back. Uh, but at that time, I didn't knew it was uh, supposed to disappear a few months later. But uh, it was obvious that it was looking like a comedy, like uh, like uh, something uh, unreal, uh, not real anymore. Uh, yeah, that's it. I think I'm kind of. Mindful of the, <laughs> of the time, uh, this seems to be kind of you know sharing happy stories seems to be a nice <laughs> end to a, to a discussion. Um, I'd like to thank you very very much for very interesting insightful contributions, all four of you, and I hope you can join me in this. Thank you. Thank you.